Well, good morning. I know it's Thursday, and uh, having done this for uh, 15 years now, and looked out at you, not just you, but all that have come before you over these years, I, I know that Thursday is often the, the tiredest day of the week, if that's the right way to say it. Uh, and so I know uh, by this time of the week, we're tired. I know I woke up and, and felt it this morning. I'm sure you did as well. I know a lot of you said you were tired yesterday, and now you're really tired. Uh, Friday, there's usually a little bit of adrenaline that kicks in, as you know, dress rehearsals coming and concert, but uh, my prayer is that in our time together this morning, uh, even though we might be a bit tired, that God would speak to us and that he would speak to us through his word, which is living and powerful and true. When it comes to questions, obviously by now you know that I like to ask them, I like to ask you questions, I like to invite you to think, invite to respond, but I, I want you to think about this. What, what would it be like if you could ask Jesus one question today? If you had the opportunity to, to, to sit with him, remember I, I, I invited us to picture Jesus sitting with us, sitting across the table, to consider how he would look at us, to consider what he would say to us, and we're going to uh, conclude with a thought about that tomorrow. But what if you could ask him a question? Because when it comes to questions, right, we all have them. Right? And God designed us, he created us to ask questions. Right? No one had to teach you when you were a kid to ask questions, did they? How many of you were that kid that asked your parents why all day long? All right, some of you. Why, why, why? Right? We intuitively know we want to ask questions, we want to understand, we want to know why. Well, today we're going to encounter a man uh, who had the privilege, who had the opportunity to do what we might only hope to do, which is to ask Jesus a question. And we're going to look at a story that I, I'm certain will be extraordinarily familiar to most of you. A story that you've heard, a story that you, we may look at and say, I know that story, uh, I, I, I get what that's all about. But although it's familiar, I, I want us to see it with fresh eyes this morning. That story is found in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your, your Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to Luke chapter 10, and, and here we're going to find a man asking Jesus a very sincere question, right? There, there were times that Jesus was asked questions that were extraordinarily sincere and genuine, and there were other times that people asked Jesus questions not out of sincerity, but out of wanting to trap him or to trick him or to get him to say something that they could use against him. But in this instance, we are going to find a very sincere question. And from it, Jesus is not going to, Jesus is going to ask him a follow-up question, and then he's going to share a parable, a story that you will find very familiar. We often refer to it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. How many say, I'm familiar with this story? All right, very familiar story. But from this familiar story, I believe God wants to, to challenge us and speak to us today. And I believe it's going to be on the lines of understanding that chesed, God's extraordinarily faithful covenant love, his willingness to do for us what we do not deserve, is something that God not only wants you to know and experience and encounter, it's something that he desires that not only your heart would resonate then in worship to him and, ex and glorify him, but that it would be reciprocated in your life. I've used those words resonate and reciprocate a lot. If you were here last week, right, you, you, you know you've heard them a lot, and I'm intentionally doing that because I want you to remember those words, and I want you to be able to not just remember those words, but my heart is that, that what we've talked about, what we've discovered in God's word in chapel last week, for you that were here, and this week, for all of us, is that they would be things that we didn't just learn about, but things that transform us and things that change the way that we live. And God desires that we would reciprocate his chesed, that chesed would not just be something we experience, but something that we do. In fact, in the Hebrew mind, chesed was always something that you do. You experienced it, you sang about it, you expressed it, and you did it. So Luke chapter 10, and beginning in verse 25, we'll just start with the first couple of verses. It says, then an expert in the law, a lawyer, stood up to test him. And he stands up to test him, but it is a very genuine testing. And he said, teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit 
eternal life. And so right away, uh, Jesus is confronted with this question. What do I need to do? How do I earn it? How do I deserve it? Because we are wired to think that we have to earn, that, that we need to do something in order to deserve something, that we do the work and we get the result. And so he's asking this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? The life of God. Right? And eternal life in, in this understanding is not just, he's not just asking a question, how do I get to heaven when I die? But how do I experience the life of God, eternal life? Right? Eternal life is not just something that starts later. It's a life that God offers us now, his life in us. And so he's asking this question, how do I inherit eternal life? And we might have expected that Jesus will say, well, you need to believe in me, right? You need to repent of your sin, right? And, and you know, I, I love the hymn just as I am, and I appreciate, it was such a beautiful moment just to listen to that hymn this morning. But I would imagine that Jesus might have queued up just as I am, right, and gave an invitation to this man. But instead he asks him a question back, because sometimes the best answer to a question is another question. Because he realized he needed to get him to a different place. So he says to this man, what is written in the law? Verse 26. How do you read it? And so he asks him a question. And, you know, there are times we get asked a question, we don't know the answer, and it stumps us or puzzles us. But then there are other times where we get asked a question, we get asked a question, and we know the answer, right? And you're like, oh, oh, pick me, right? Have you ever been there, right? or at least known someone, right? The teacher asks a question, and you know the answer. You stick your hand right up, pick me, pick me, I know the answer. Well, I'm sure for a moment, when Jesus begins to ask him a question, there's a bit of nerves, but then all of a sudden he, he says, ah, this is a softball question. I, this is an easy one. I, I know the answer. He rattled off the answer immediately. Look at verse 27. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. Right, he knew exactly where to go. He begins, first of all, by quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, was a passage that every Jewish person knew by heart. It was there, John 3, 16. Are you with me? Right, it, there, there it says in Deuteronomy 6, and you don't need to turn there, but just listen. He's, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. And so this is something every Jewish person would have memorized. Deuteronomy goes on, Moses instructs them to talk about these things at home, to teach their children, right? And this is something that would have been imprinted on their mind. And so he answers this question. You know, his question is, how do I inherit eternal life? How do, how do I have the life of God? And Jesus says, well, what does the law say? And he says, well, I need to love God with all my heart, with all my, all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind. And then he includes Leviticus 19. I should love my neighbor as myself. And look at Jesus' response in verse 20. He says, you have answered correctly. Boy, that must have felt good in the mo for a second, right? I mean, hear Jesus say, yes, you got the answer correct. But this man knows that even though he's answered the question correctly, he, he, he knows that something's still missing. And so Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And Jesus knows that it is impossible for him to do this without God's grace, without God's help, but he's trying to draw that out of him. And so he says, do this and you will live. But wanting, verse 29, to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? How do, how do I know who my neighbor is? And as we step back, we realize that as he measures himself against the law, he makes some assumptions, which we all know can be what? Dangerous. And he first of all makes an assumption that he is fulfilling the first part of this. Because notice his question has to do with who is my neighbor. But he assumes that he has fulfilled the commandment to love God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength, and with all of his mind. And yet, no one has ever been able to do that. Not completely, not fully, not you, not me, not him. His second mistake is thinking that he could possibly 
that, 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 it would, that he could not fulfill the second half if he had done the first. You see, if he was actually loving God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, and with all of his mind, if that was actually being done, then loving his neighbor right, would happen. Right, because when we encounter, when we experience, when we, are, when we are transformed by God's radical, incredible love, it changes us and it flows out of our life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, the Apostle John says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. His third faulty assumption was that he wanted to narrowly define who his neighbor was. He wanted to choose who his neighbor was. You know, there are people in our life for whom it's easy to love, for whom it might be say, it'd be easy to show acts of chesed. It'd be easy to show them undeserved kindness and favor. It'd be easy to do that because I know them, I love them, I care about them. There, there's a connection. But there are So, Jesus then responds with a parable, with a story. So, as this man asks this question, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds with a story. Stories have a way sometimes of imprinting truth in us in a way that just mere facts and information can't. And so, he shares this story that you're familiar with. Look at verse 30. Jesus took up the question and said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers. And they stripped him and beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And in the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. So we're presented with this story. And it's a story that they, they all could have related to because this, this was a story that, that connected with real life. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho, which was a very steep road. I, I have had the privilege of going to Israel a long time ago. And having driven, I drove the, re, got, well, I wasn't driving, I was in a bus. You're with me, right? But I had the privilege of driving from Jericho, from that area, to Jerusalem. And it's, it's, a, it's a massive change in elevation, right? As you're down in the, the basically what is the beginning of the Great Rift Valley, down near where the Dead Sea is and you go all the way up to Jerusalem. It's also, it's a windy, and it's, it's, it's wilderness. And when I think of wilderness, I think of jungle, right? Trees and forests, but their wilderness is rocks and dirt and sand. And it is a isolated place. And so this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it was a dangerous road to travel because it was isolated, it was steep, and it was known for a place where people would rob you or take advantage of you. And so when they heard, Anyone who was listening to this story, they, they would have been nodding, right? You ever heard a story like, yeah, yeah, tracking with that. And so this man's going down, and he fell into the hand of robbers. Not, not an unusual story, right? He's beat up and he left for, for dead. And then a priest and a Levite are traveling down the road and they see him, but instead of rendering aid or checking on him, they just slide to the other side. They sort of put their blinders on. I didn't, I didn't see that. And they keep going. And, and there could be a lot of reasons, a lot of possibilities. First of all, to, to touch this man would have rendered them ceremonially unclean. Right? They're, they're priests. He's a priest and a Levite. Right? And so there, there are rituals that they have to go through to be ceremonially unclean. And they, man, if I touch this guy, it's going to be a huge hassle to become clean. A lot more time and energy than I want to, want to expand. May might have been thinking, you know, if I stop and help this guy, the people that did that to him might not be very far away. I better keep going. They might have thought, someone should really help me. Somebody ought to do that. But I don't know first aid. And, you know, kind of looks like he's pretty much gone anyway. Maybe I should just pray for him. Maybe he shouldn't have been traveling alone. Yeah, it's his fault. You know, it's easy, isn't it, to rationalize, to make excuses for not doing what we ought to do. And at, at this point, I imagine it's starting to become obvious to this man and to all who are listening to Jesus where this is going. Because this priest and this Levite, 
they should have known. You know, has, has anyone ever told you that you ought to have known better? Anybody ever tell you that? You should have known better. Doesn't feel very good to hear that, does it? But these were the ones who were most obliged to perform acts of mercy. Because while God's law certainly gave them instructions about being ritually and ceremonially clean, it also instructed them about the God who was full of chesed. And that they were to do acts of chesed. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, I never knew a man refuse help, refuse to help the poor who failed to give at least one admirable excuse. It's easy to rationalize. It's easy to convince yourself why this isn't my problem, why this isn't my situation. I don't need, it's not, I, I, didn't, I didn't cause this, it's not my fault, I have somewhere to be. But notice how the story goes on, and here's where, if you were in the original audience, your jaw would have hit the floor. You would have been like, uh-uh. No way. Because notice what he says, but a Samaritan. And as soon as they heard the word Samaritan, their blood pressure would have went up a little bit. Their heart rate would have went up a little bit. Are you with me? Because the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They were enemies. The Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile, and they, they worshiped in a different place. They were considered social outsiders, religious outsiders. They, they were considered almost worse than even just a regular Gentile. You remember the story when Jesus is traveling in John chapter 4. And normally Jews, when they went from north to south in Israel, they would avoid Samaria. They would go way out of their way. They'd set their GPS to avoid Samaria. Are you with me? Right? When they plugged in Google Maps, right? It had, you know how it says, like, no tolls, fastest route, you know, rural, you know, you want to go the long way. I don't know why it always gives you, like, the option to go an hour longer. Anybody ever notice that? It doesn't make any sense. I always want to get there as fast as I can. Show me the fastest way, the most highway. I don't care about the tolls. I just want to get there. But their settings said avoid Samaria. Right? And so they would always click avoid Samaria. And Jesus said, I, I have to go through Samaria. So as soon as they heard this, as soon as they heard Jesus say, but a Samaritan, but like everybody, you know, if they were sleepy, they weren't sleepy anymore. If they were checking their, if they were scrolling and checking Instagram, they put their phone away. Are you with me? They're like, what? What did he say? Samaritan? A Samaritan on his journey came up to him. Hmm? What's he, well, a Samaritan's probably going to kick him. Right? I mean, what else would a Samaritan do? But it says when he saw the man, he had compassion. Remember, compassion is one of the words that is tied to our word chesed. It's one of the words that has said draws to itself. This Samaritan has compassion on this man who we would assume is Jewish, based on how Jesus is telling the story. And he went over to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine, and then he put him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spent. This would have shocked this man, this lawyer, who was asking a sincere question. Teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And now, somehow, we're talking about a Samaritan. Never thought the conversation was going to go this way. And Jesus would have shocked his audience. There would have been tension thick in the air. Because Jews and Samaritans despised each other. They hated each other. This would be the last thing you would expect. But here is this incredible picture, right, of God's chesed. The one from whom I have the right or deserve or expect nothing chooses to give me everything. This wounded Jewish man would have had no expectation that the Samaritan, whom he probably lived his life hating, stopped and cared for him and rescued him and ministered to him, put him on his animal, took him to an inn, took care of him, and then left enough money to take care of his whole bill. It's really an incredible picture of God's extraordinary love, God's kindness that he offers to the undeserved. And because ultimately all of us, in one sense, are that wounded man who needs rescue, who needs redemption. It's 
spiritually. But he also is telling this story so that we'll understand how God wants us to see people. This man had compassion. And again, it's shocking because Jews and Gentiles hated each other. In fact, it was taught by some rabbis that a Jews were forbidden to help a Gentile woman or assist her in childbirth. Because all they were doing is bringing another Gentile into the world. That's, that's, how, that's how hard their hearts had become. That's how distorted their thinking had become. And in their mind, a Samaritan was worse than just your ordinary Gentile. And so that, you need to understand that in order to understand the, the shock value of what Jesus is saying. And so Jesus tells this story. It's, it's quite brief. It wouldn't have taken him long to share. And then Jesus asks him another question. Look at verse 36. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now Jesus is asking him a question that there's only one way to answer this question, isn't there? And how many of you would think that this man does not want to answer like, have you ever been asked a question you don't want to answer? Right? Because you know the answer, and you know the person who's asking you probably knows the answer, but you don't want to say it. You don't want to admit it. And so he says, which one of the three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And I imagine maybe with his eyes looking down and, and quite a, a low voice, he said, the one who showed mercy. And he can't say Samaritan. No, the one who showed mercy to him. The one who did has said. And then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Go and do the same. In effect, the question that this man needed to understand is that it's not that our goal isn't to figure out who our neighbor is. It's to recognize that whomever God puts in our path is our neighbor. Right? I've been told to understand like this, your neighbor is anyone who isn't you. Your neighbor is anyone who isn't you. Go and do likewise. And obviously, Jesus is teaching this parable, this story, to help him understand the condition of his heart. To help him discover that, that he hasn't actually loved God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength, and all of his mind. That he's not loving his neighbor at himself. And he's missing the heart of God and missing what eternal life is all about. Charles Spurgeon, who I quoted earlier, said this. He said, when we see innocent persons suffering as the result of sin of others, our pity should be excited. That when we see people that are hurt, when we see people that are wounded, when we see people that are broken, that God is calling us to be a neighbor to them. That God is wanting to use you as a vessel, as an instrument, to communicate, to deliver, to offer His love and His grace and His mercy and His compassion and His kindness. Now, our world is filled with needs, and it can be overwhelming sometimes. And because of technology and social media, we're exposed to so much brokenness and need that it, it can just be debilitating. And then we kind of think, well, the, it's, the problem's so big, what difference will it make if I do anything? Have you ever felt like that? Right? I mean, I mean, what does it matter, right? The problem's so big. But here's the thing. God hasn't called you or me to be the savior of the world. Are you with me? One of the most important things that I learned from one of my mentors in ministry, that he told me often, he said, you are no one's savior. There's only one savior, and his name is Jesus. And I am not that savior. You are not that savior. And so I don't bear the burden of saving the world, and I, don't, I cannot bear the burden of helping everyone. But I can do something for those that God puts in my path. For those that God has put in my life. I heard a pastor say it like this one time. He said, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. 
I came across this quote, and I'm not exactly sure who it originally should be attributed to, but it says, the world would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before them. The world would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before them. How do we do that? Well, we know from Scripture that following the law, trying to do it ourselves, never works. It's not about, we talk about, it's not about external acts. It's not just about doing something. It's about discovering and experiencing God's love for yourself. It's about knowing Him as your Savior and experiencing the set of God personally in your life, that God really does love you, right? That the truth of Scripture is real, that God really did love the world, and that world includes you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have what? what? Eternal life. The very thing that, that this man was asking, how do, I, how do I get it to eternal life? And we know where the source of eternal life is. We receive it by faith. Right? It's not of works. Right? It's not something that we do. It's not something that we earn or deserve. But God offers it freely by and through Jesus to you and to me. And we become recipients of by faith of His love and His grace and His mercy. And then God calls us to be agents who then reciprocate that to our world. And God is calling you to live a life of doing. And God has put people in your life and will put people in your life who need to encounter His love. And so I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge myself. Right? God has given us a great task in this world. He's given us what we call the Great Commission, right? To go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to, to announce the good news that there is a God who created the world, that that God who created the world loves this world, that that God who created the world and loves his world entered his world personally, and that he lived among us, and that he went to a cross and bore our sin and our shame and our guilt, that he died and that he rose from the dead, and that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, the life of God in them now and for all of eternity. And he said we're to go and proclaim that message, right, making disciples, teaching them to observe, right, all things that I've commanded, right, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said I'll be with you always. We have a great commission. But we cannot fulfill the Great Commission if we don't understand and do the Great Commandment. Remember, someone asked Jesus one day, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said what? To love God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And a second is like it. To do what? Anybody know? To love your neighbor as your what? Yourself. And so two things this morning, two points of application. Know and experience God has said for you. And this is something we've been talking about. But you need to, before you can love any neighbor, before you can do this, you need to know God loves you. And you need to experience his love through salvation. Once you're saved, many of you know Jesus as your Savior. You, you know Him. And you need to have frequent and ongoing encounters with His love for you. You need to spend time with Him in His Word. You need to spend time communicating with Him in prayer, in worship, in fellowship with other believers. And one of the reasons it, it can feel so easy in some ways to live out our faith here at Chehi is because we have all those things so readily available to us. We have chapel in the morning. We have fellowship all day long with other believers. Right? We have devotions with our counselor. We have times where we sing hymns of praise to God and we worship Him. And, and without a doubt, one of my favorite parts of the day. I love listening to you sing. I love listening to you proclaim the praises of God and the truths of God's Word. But we need to make sure that we are doing those things outside of you. Because the beginning of loving our neighbor as ourself, the beginning of doing chesed, is experiencing it and knowing it through Christ for ourselves. Because you can't give what you don't have. You can't give someone something that you don't have. You know, I, you know if you came to me and said, I need $100,000 right now. I could not give you what you need. 
Why? Somebody tell me why I could not give that to you. Because, you, yeah, she knows I don't have that money. Don't have it. I could have all the willingness and the, I could have, I'm like, man, I would love to do that for you. But if, if I don't have it, I can't give it. And if you've not experienced God's love, and if you're not continuing to encounter and experience God's love, you won't be able to live a life like this. Number two, know and share God's chesed with others. Know and share God's chesed with others. I want to challenge you to open your eyes. And I want to ask, invite you to ask God, to say, God, help me to see people. Help me to see them the way you see them. You know, it's easy in the busyness of life just to you know, rush by. Maybe, you know, maybe the priest and the Levite, besides wanting you know, to avoid danger or being ceremonially unclean, it's like maybe they're just in a hurry. And sometimes it's easy. I know I can develop tunnel vision. Right, where I'm just so focused on what I'm doing or where I'm going that I don't even notice what's around. And sometimes we just get desensitized because there's so much brokenness or problems or these things and we just don't think about it anymore. But ask God to say, God, open my eyes. Help me to see people and help me to see them the way you see them. Not just see them for their faults or their problems or their issues, but help me to see them as one whom you created one who's made in your image, one whom you desire for them to know your love and grace. Open not only your eyes, but your life. Right? God wants us to open our lives to others. Right? That's what this man did that Jesus told this story. If he opened his life to him, he, he ministered to him. And he didn't just you know, throw some Band-Aids at him. He didn't just say, here's some Advil, good luck. Are you with me? He, he, he touched him. He ministered to him. He put him on his animal. He took him to a hotel. He took care of him. He opened his life to him. And again, we can't do this for everyone. God doesn't expect you to do it for everyone. But God will put people in your life from whom he wants you to minister to. Open your mouth and speak words of hope, words of grace and compassion to others. You know, words are so powerful. And God gives you the opportunity to speak words. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that life and death are in the power of the tongue. You have the opportunity to speak life. And so I want to challenge you to look and to pray for opportunities to show God's love. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to do it today. I want you to be on the lookout today to say, who is someone who I can show God's love to, God's kindness to, God's grace? Be, ask God to open your eyes. It might be a fellow camper. It might be your counselor. It might be someone working in the cafeteria. It might be someone cleaning the door. Ask God to say, God, open my eyes. Seek to do chesed every day. It's God's call on our life to distribute his love and his grace. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the day before us that you've given to us. Lord, a day that will be busy and full. And Father, we look forward to all that you're going to do today. I pray that you give everyone energy and strength and health and grace to handle all the practice and rehearsals and lessons that they need to put themselves into today. I pray it would be a day of growth and, and joy as they grow. But Father, I pray that today that we would both know your love for us and have the opportunity to share that love with others. But Lord, may it not just be today, but may it become a way that we live. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.